So again, you're going to see me talking about a lot of opinions because, again, another topic that there's not a lot of data for. Uh, so again, a lot of hopefully um, insights, but not a lot of evidence to be talked about. So it's, we're talking about cardiorenal syndrome. Once again, I have no disclosures. And the objective today for the next 20 odd minutes is to, be to review some of the pathophysiology and physiology of the renal cardiovascular interaction, review the rationale and the practical implications of the management of cardiorenal syndromes, which from now on I'll call CRS, and understanding the limitations of the current approach to cardiorenal syndrome and explore future directions. Now, one of the things we know is that we know that renal failure in, heart, in someone who's got heart failure is associated with worse outcome. But how about the change in renal function, i.e. worsening renal function, WRF, which is a terminology that we use? Diamond actually in 2007 showed very clearly that as you get an increase of creatinine, in this case of 0.3 uh, milligrams per deciliter, there's an increase in mortality in the patient population. And for those that use the uh, SI units, it's, that's an increase of greater than 26.5 uh, uh, micromoles per, per liter. So it's not just the baseline of creatinine that is associated with poor outcome, but also any change in worsening in function is also uh, associated with poor outcome. The risk factors for this WRF are, of course, if you have pre-existing renal dysfunction, the severity of heart failure, the extremes of blood pressure, either very, very high pressures or very low blood pressures. Anemia, interestingly enough, is also a very significant risk factor for WRF. And Diuretics, which is, I guess, one of the treatments for uh, heart failure, but is, again, also associated with worsening renal failure, as well as some others, such as ACE inhibitors. Classification was difficult because, of course, it's something that is very heterogeneous, but Dr. Claudio Ronco from Italy uh, over the last, in 2008, came up with a more straightforward, intuitive classification, which dealt with, essentially, types of cardiorenal syndrome. Type 1 was a cardiorenal syndrome whereby the heart acutely decompensates leading to some renal dysfunction, as is seen in, in acute decompensated heart failure or cardiogenic shock or even in acute coronary syndromes. In type 2, you have a chronic cardiorenal syndrome and a chronic heart failure syndrome, for example, leads to overall a long-term decrease in renal function. And then type 3 and 4 have to do more with renal cardiac, whereby renal disease leads to some cardiac dysfunction either acutely or chronically. And type 5, as you can imagine, deals with secondary causes of both cardiac and renal failure. Now, the interesting thing, however, is in type 1, CRS, which is the acute cardiorenal syndrome, there, in most patients presenting to hospital acute decomposite heart failure, anywhere from 27 to 45% will experience a sudden or an acute deterioration in renal function as opposed to the general heart failure population outside, about 38-56% of patients will have a renal dysfunction that actually increases over time. Now, as I mentioned before, it is a very intuitive and easy to understand classifications. But as somebody very wise said once, you know, everything should be made as simple as possible, but not simpler. And there are concerns and problems and criticisms to this particular classification. Now, uh, Branko Bram and I work very closely together uh, in, in doing some research in this area. And he actually wrote a paper in, in Nature uh, Reviews and Nephrology uh, a year ago talking about some of the concerns. One, the current classification is, yes, it is simple, it's practical, and it's appealing, but it lacks universal definitions. Everyone has a different idea of what actually means to have an acute deterioration oftentimes. And of course, there's no mechanistic framework that of course doesn't allow us to look at treatments, but also looking at research. So the evolution and the hope is that as we move forward, this classification will evolve and progress to something that's more integrative, better defined, but also takes into account a lot more of the interaction of cardiovascular and renal factors that affect both uh, these uh, processes. The obligatory pathophys pathophysiology slide, again, to suggest that in heart failure, as we know, there are many, many different etiologies and it causes, both from hemodynamic and non-hemodynamic uh, problems. And all of those can then lead to renal dysfunction, which can be further exacerbated by pre-existing disease as well. Memorizing this is not necessary, just remembering they're both renal, cardiac, both hemodynamic and non-hemodynamic factors. So going on to the practical stuff, how do you diagnose and how do you monitor? Well, you need to come up with some practical definitions because there's so much heterogeneity. How do we then define the, these cardiovascular syndromes? 
Type 1 is defined as a WRF or worsening renal function within 48 hours of hospitalization for advanced heart failure, uh, decomposite heart failure, and is an increase of greater than 26.5 millimoles per liter or a greater than 25% increase in serum creatinine from baseline. Now, cystatin C, which is a, probably a better marker and is seen earlier, can also be used if your center has that, as it also has predictive value from a prognosis standpoint. The unfortunate thing about CRS type 2, which is the chronic cardiorenal syndrome, is that there's no clear definition, and more times than not, you can't differentiate CRS 2 from CRS 4, which is the renal cardiac chronic disease. So that is a little bit more difficult. From a monitoring standpoint, why do we do it? To see how people are doing, how they're responding to the interventions, but also clinical parameters which can be useful uh, in research and things that uh, allow us to move forward from where we are. Clinical parameters are useful, a GVP and things like that, but from a cardiorenal standpoint, really not very much discerning power. So what we use instead is biomarkers and imaging, of course. From a standard cardiac biomarker standpoint, we're talking about mostly BNP and troponin. Troponin is seen mostly in uh, ACS, but even without the context of an acute coronary syndrome, troponins can be elevated in patients with significant renal dysfunction, as we all know. Now, BNP is used often uh, in cardiac disease, but in cardiorenal syndrome is also something that can be useful. Important to remember, the nt pro bnp which is a precursor oftentimes used in many centers, is probably uh, not as good because it's more affected by renal function. Therefore, it can be quite significantly elevated in somebody with renal dysfunction. Imaging, echo and MRI, is helpful initially in making the diagnosis and helping with that, but it's got very limited value in, in monitoring the course of treatment. A little bit about BNP. So I, I said the BNP can be changed in patients with cardiorenal syndrome. So specifically, if you look at, at this data from uh, Maisel, uh, published in 2011, the baseline BNP for someone without heart failure who has cardiovascular syndrome 2 is actually elevated rather than being around a, in a 50 to 100 like we expect in a regular cardiovascular population, can be closer to 230 or something like that. So the baseline is increased. So what does that mean? It means that when we're looking at patients coming in to hospital with cardiovascular syndrome, you have to realize that the BNP levels can be elevated even a baseline, even if it, they're not experiencing an acute decompensation in heart failure. So oftentimes, the 500 cutoff that we use for diagnosis can still be used, but you should always remember that that is perhaps not quite as good a marker at that level they would be in a patient without a cardiovenal syndrome. From a renal standpoint, of course, there are many different things that we can use, and creatinine is the commonest used marker. The problem with creatinine, of course, is very insensitive, and rather than an injury marker, is a function marker. So being a function marker, it works quite well for CRS2, the chronic cardiovascular syndrome, but actually does not give us much insight in terms of the CRS1, which is more injury mediated rather than function. The other thing is that in the ADHERE registry, which is one of the largest uh, registries for heart failure, acute, acute decompensated heart failure, urea, specifically at a level of 15.4 millimoles per liter, was actually a better prognosticator than creatinine was. And why is that? Part of it is because if you look at creatinine, it actually doesn't go up that quickly. So if you have someone who comes into hospital with acute decompensated heart failure, it actually takes a long time, upwards of 48 hours for the creatinine to start to respond to, high, to uh, you know, injury in this case, as opposed to many of the others which may actually not only respond better, but earlier. So if creatinine, for example, was to be a better marker, you should look more like this in terms of the creatinine response to the actual GFR. So there's always a bit of a lag, and that's why creatinine doesn't work quite as well. With those limitations, then, we want better markers. So there are many that are being looked at. Again, as I mentioned, cystatin C is very commonly used in a lot of countries and a lot of centers, and probably much better than creatinine because it's an earlier marker of AKI, acute kidney injury. But many of the others, and of course, I'm quite favorable to KIM-1 because, of course, I remember it very easily. It's, by the way, it's not KIM. It's actually something else. But ultimately speaking, it's a very, very good thing to look at because we need markers that do a better job than creatinine does. As an interventional cardiologist and a transplant cardiologist, I tend to actually emphasize a lot of the invasive type stuff. And as I mentioned to you previously in my previous talk, the SCAPE trial published in JAMA with Lynn Warner Stevenson showed that PA catheter-based hemodynamic tailing wasn't beneficial in the general acute decompensated population. But really, they didn't look at the CRS population. So if you look at mostly, uh, you know, we still use it 
especially when you can't really assess volume status on a patient. GVP is difficult to assess, so you don't really know what they're doing, and if they're hypotensive. As far as therapies are concerned, the questions really come up here. We really don't know how to deal with these people very well and very effectively. But I'm going to give you a general approach and then deal with the specific areas a little bit at a time. Thomas Haywood from Scripps actually has got a really good book. Uh, if you're interested in this, a really nicely written book, very clinically based. And he says five questions that should be asked for anybody coming in with cardiorenal syndrome. One, what is their volume status? Two, is the blood pressure adequate for renal perfusion? Three, what is the cardiac output, which can be different than the blood pressure, because blood pressure, of course, is not just cardiac output, but it's also vasoconstriction, right? Is there evidence of high uh, center venous pressure? And is there intrinsic renal disease? So what do we do first? We prevent. Anytime you can prevent something from happening, you're better off than trying to deal with it. It's better to not have it happen than to try to patch it. So you really identify and avoid precipitating factors as early as possible. Regular outpatient monitoring of dual organ function, either with things like daily weights, vitals, urine output, and labs, but also imaging as appropriate. Because as I mentioned before, in a chronic setting, imaging can be quite helpful in monitoring progression. Uh, of course, not quite as well in this case, but it can be. But the other thing to do is very, very important, is to encourage the beneficial non-pharmacological interventions that we oftentimes forget. Moderate exercise, again, being shown to be beneficial in all heart failure populations. Smoking cessation as well. Diet and nutritional care is very important. And of course, as mentioned previously by my colleague Apakara, compliance with treatments is something that needs to be emphasized. So there are standard recommendations, mostly for heart failure or for renal failure. But there are no standard recommendations or guidelines for cardiorenal failure. Now, in those with CRS2, the chronic cardiorenal syndrome is very easy. Follow the usual ESC, AHA, CCS guidelines. With the acute setting CRS1 patients, however, there's no standardized recommendation. And mostly because all the trials we talked about excluded patients with significant renal dysfunction. And not only that, they didn't necessarily follow these patients afterwards. So we really don't know how the CRS1 patients fit in the context of the recommendations. One slide on the management of CRS2. Yes, follow the guidelines, as I mentioned. Uh, but the couple of things that you might tweak in these patients. If there is no indication for aspirin, stop it. Now, this part of the recommendation is very difficult to do. Many, about five years ago, I said this, people would throw things at me. Now we know because aspirin really isn't as beneficial, especially in primary prevention in many of the populations, stopping aspirin, if there isn't a primary indication, should be done. We are pushed to always push the medications to target those, target those, target those. Well, in patients with CRS too, with renal dysfunction related to cardiac disease, lowering the doses of diuretics uh, in ACE, ACE and ARBs can be helpful, especially if they are patients who are hypotensive. Okay? And then switching beta blockers to curvitolol, and I'll mention the reason why later on. But curvitolol seems to be a little bit better than most other beta blockers. Now, this is where the meat uh, is, is where the cardiovenous syndrome type 1 comes in. This is what is most challenging. These are the patients you'll see in hospital. And these are the ones who are going to keep you awake at night because you don't know what to do with them. As I mentioned previously, and right ventricular function and failure and cardiovenous syndrome go actually together, hand in hand. That's why a lot of the things will overlap a little bit. Previously mentioned, CVP, 5 to 8, perfect. Don't have to go too much higher than that, but also try not to go too much lower than that. If they are depleted intravascularly, i.e. pre-renal, then a slow volume loading becomes important. And again, depending on the situation, you may want to give it faster, but usually slow. If they're high intravascular volume, however, you need to aim for negative balance of 0.5 to 1 liter per day using whatever measures we, we talked about. Diuretics commonly used, mainstay, we do it, everybody's comfortable, middle of the night they call you, you say, give some Lasix, right? It's easy. It is effective. It decreases intravascular volume. But one, it needs adequate renal perfusion. Two, as I mentioned, aggressive rate of diuresis will cause neurohormone activation, which especially in cardiovascular syndrome can be actually harmful. The other thing is insufficient diuresis can also lead to WRF, and this is something I'm going to spend a little bit more time later on. One thing that's practical to remember, and I'm not sure if you have that available here, but torsamide and bumetanine, which are again loop diuretics, are much better in this population because they're liver metabolized. So they're not quite as dependent on renal metabolism as furosemide is. They're, they're all renally excreted, but metabolism actually happens in the liver for the other two. 
The question that always gets asked, especially in patients who have renal dysfunction on top of that in CRS cases, CRS1, what do you do? High dose, infusion, and so on. You all know the DOSE study, which was done in New England Journal 2011. They found no difference between bolus versus continuous infusion. However, dealing with specific CRS and looking at WRF, worsening renal function, the high dose was associated with better diuresis and symptoms but there was more worsening of renal function. However, this is one thing that gets forgotten sometimes. By the time these patients were discharged from hospital, the renal function normalized to baseline. So WRF was much improved by that time. So more commonly than not, in the situation we say higher dose diuretics, good idea, except that in the short, maybe day or two, you might see a slight bump. Don't shy away at that point. With that said, though, in the long term, there's good data showing that diuretic usage is associated with increased mortality. Now, is it the diuretic alone or is it because they're sicker? This is actually data in 2006, a little bit of data, but still applies. Dose-based, the lower the dose, the lower the mortality. The higher the dose of urosemide might require by a patient, and this is a multivariate analysis, so it does take other things into account, but the higher the dose, the higher the mortality. So we know that Diuretics, albeit important and helpful in the management of these patients, can be associated with increased mortality, especially if doses are high. But I just told you, use higher doses for diuresis, but I'm telling you, it kills people. So what do you do? Well, in a very difficult situation, right? So we really don't know. So then you start looking for other alternatives. What do you do? Ultrafiltration is something that we do, so either directly with the vena venous ultrafiltration machine or sometimes putting them on dialysis, continuous dialysis. What this does, it, it allows us to get fluid out and much more gradually. Now the data in the general population show that similar uh, renal function changes to standard treatment, but it's a much better and much more effective fluid removal. And of course, in this case, also decreased risk of hospitalization in 90 days. Realizing that much of the hospitalization post heart failure uh, decompensation happens because of inadequate diuresis prior to discharge. So a lot of these papers are still a bit overloaded. Unfortunately, a further study, a CARES specifically as a larger study, really didn't show a benefit. If anything, actually show worsening function of the kidneys with ultrafiltration. Why is that? Why is this discrepancy? In CARES, they really did not compare ultrafiltration to standard of care. They actually compared to something called stepped uh, pharmacological care. They had an algorithm which was followed by all centers, which meant that in the first two days, they adjusted diuretics to maintain a diuresis of three to five meters a day. If by that time that did not occur, then they were put on dopamine or dobutamine, even if the blood pressure was 110. So anything below 110 were considered, especially if the EF was 40%. And of course, they also used nitroglycerin and the zerotides. And as you can see, this is not standard therapy. This is much more aggressive therapy. And after 72 hours, if urine output was not appropriate, they started and crossed over to ultrafiltration or a hemodynamic therapies such as anotropic medications. And of course, all of those things could have affected the results of caress. So do we still use this? Absolutely. Do we use the particular machine? No. But we do realize that in patients who are unresponsive, either because of different reasons or they have diuretic resistance, getting diuresis is important, and you'll know why later on when I talk about this. How about standard therapies, ACE inhibitors, beta blockers, and aldosterone blockers? We're told don't stop it, don't stop it, don't stop it. Well, for ACE and aldosterone antagonists, we know that when you put people on it, their GFR gets worse. This is known. Everyone gets an increase in GFR if you put, put them on an ACE inhibitor. In the CRS2 patients, there are recommendations that says that if the creatinine goes up a greater than 30% of baseline, then the ACE inhibitor should either be stopped or decreased. So in CRS1, in the acute setting, whereby the definition is greater than 25% increase of creatinine acutely, we stop the ACE and the aldosterone antagonist on admission at that point. With that said, however, the beta blockers we do not stop because there is some evidence suggesting that curvedilol specifically improves renal hemodynamics, and in some cases, there's one study that showed better improved renal function, not necessarily in CRS, but in the general heart failure population. And as such, in CRS1, cardiovenous syndrome, acute cardiovenous syndrome, we don't stop it, we don't consider stopping unless there's hemodynamic compromise, and of course, if they're being started on inotropic support.
On vasoactive medications, dopamine is oftentimes used, okay? However, low-dose dopamine, the rose heart failure and the dad heart failure two studies showed there was no benefit of dopamine. So the idea of low-dose, quote-unquote, renal-dose dopamine really isn't supported by the literature. The Zertite, which is a BNP analog, uh, again, showed not to be beneficial in this uh, CRS population. And the butaminomirinone, of course, never been looked at specifically in this, and as you know, it may improve initial hemodynamics, but they do maybe increase mortality, specifically with mirinone. So really not a lot of data in here. So we need more things, something else. So there's something called an A1 adenosine receptor antagonist, which was a very, very promising therapy. And the reason why that was is because it affects both the kidneys and the heart, but it affects other things, the brain and all the things. Cardiac effects, the A1 receptor decreases heart rate and decreases atrial contraction. A2, coronary vasodilation, and A3 may be cardioprotected by other mechanisms. And the renal effects, of course, specifically A1, it increases sodium and water retention. So the thought was if you block the A1 adenosine receptor, you might actually improve renal function in case, but also increase heart rate and increase atrial contraction, therefore increasing cardiac. So it was a win-win, right? Initial studies, very helpful. Uh, they were exciting. Project uh, Protect 1, which is the pilot study, showed very promising results. So they went on to Protect 2. And unfortunately, the larger study did not show any benefits from a renal standpoint to using a, a, a one receptor, the adenosine receptor antagonist. So the question is, what's the future for these uh, A1 receptor antagonists in adenosine, in CRS specifically? Three major trials that were actually either ongoing or planned, the Reno Defender, Trident 1, and the Poseidon, have all been canceled or suspended. So chances are, we're probably not gonna hear much about this, at least not in the near future. In, in the realm of um, heart failure. Any other candidates? Vasopressin uh, antagonists, tovaptin, and the calcium sensitizers in levosimendin, which may have benefits in the regular uh, heart failure population, that's debatable. In the CRS cardiorenal population, absolutely no renal benefit as far as we know, and no data to support the use. One area where maybe some excitement is serolaxin, which is a relaxing agonist uh, uh, analog. In the relaxing uh, AHF, there was no difference in primary endpoints, but there was some improvement in signs of heart failure and decreased mortality at six months. And when they did a post hoc analysis looking at specifically renal function, it showed a decreased incidence of worsening renal function with serolaxin. So Adrian Vores, who actually does uh, most of the studies, actually very excited when I was talking to him last time, saying that this may be the niche area of serolaxin uh, over the future. So the question really comes down to why are these therapies so ineffective, even though some are promising, most of them are not ineffective. Perhaps we're just missing the target. We don't know what we're doing. We're getting up there, but really not getting what we need to get. And this is probably why. There's a beautiful study by Wilfred Mullins and by uh, just Tan from um, Cleveland. And what they found is they looked at all hemodynamic parameters and renal uh, function worsening. And what they found, interestingly enough, that the only hemodynamic parameter associated with worsening renal function was CVP, central venous pressure. There was no change with blood pressure, no change with wedge pressure, and no change with cardiac index. If anything, there was actually an increase in renal dysfunction with higher cardiac index, which is very counterintuitive because we're taught to believe pre-renal, pre-renal, pre-renal. But what this suggests is that perhaps that in cardiorenal syndrome is the right-sided filling pressures or the venous, uh, renal venous uh, hypervolemia. The same group actually then went on to actually look at what if you were to decrease the uh, venous pressure on the left side? Is there an improvement? And sure enough, when you decrease intra-abdominal pressures by all means possible, it was associated with significant improvement in renal function. So what's the bottom line? What am I telling you? The renal, renal venous congestion or right sided congestion is likely to be the primary hemodynamic mechanism underlying CRS1 and not flow and perfusion necessarily. I'm not saying that that doesn't play a part, but it is. So do not be afraid to diurese. It's very common for people to shy away from diuresing when the renal function is worsening, especially in advanced advanced or decomposite heart failure patients with CRS1, these patients, even if the creatinine goes up, you diarrhea more aggressively than anything else. So practical points. How do you know that the abdominal pressure is up? Well, the easiest way is to put a bladder catheter. And we measure that to measure intra-abdominal pressures. And less than eight is normal. 12, up to greater than 12 is somebody's got intra-abdominal hypertension. 
And if it's greater than 20, they have abdominal compartment syndrome. It's as scary as it sounds. It's true compartmental syndrome, whereby they can actually lose organ function and die from it. So if you have somebody who's got an intra-abdominal pressure of 12 to 20, usual things, sodium water restriction, diuresis, and so on, vasoactive agents, and sometimes mechanical interventions like dialysis may be necessary. But if they have abdominal compartment syndrome, this, is, this becomes a medical urgency or even an emergency because they can very quickly decompensate and die. In this case then, going very aggressively, including paracentesis, gastrointestinal decompression, as well as even going as far as warm muscular paralytics is something that's done, and of course dialysis as well. So challenges, we need more stringent standardized diagnostic and therapeutic definitions. We need to identify better and sensitive markers to look at how patients are doing and identifying better what the primary hemodynamic and non-hemodynamic factors are underlying CRS. So what's the next move? Uh, Bram, uh, Branko, Branko, Bram, and I have been doing a lot of work in auto-regulation. And this, like they say, right, to a man with a hammer, everything looks like a nail. So to me, everything's auto-regulation, right? So looking at it, if you look at how the heart works, whether it be half PEF or half REF, there's a significant portion of the heart, of the kidneys that suffer because there may be a disturbance in the auto-regulation of the kidneys, specifically you know, blood flow. So what we've done, we looked at deciding whether auto-regulation actually exists. Up to this point, there's been never a human study looking at auto-regulation in the kidneys. So we actually were able to use um, Doppler wires into the renal vasculature and then see, and we had that demonstrated that looking at Doppler signals compared to blood pressure differentials, and we made a change by exciting the patients and talking to them, moving them around sometimes, or just giving them medications. We found that in this particular case, the presence of autoregulation is real in humans, not just in pigs and things. This is actually just, we just presented at the uh, Experimental Biology Conference just this past uh, spring. So this is the first inhuman measurement of true renal autoregulation. As you can see here, even though the blood pressure goes up and down, the renal blood flow is nice and steady. So your kidneys have this amazing ability to adapt to changes in hemodynamics. Problem, however, is there is the thought that in heart failure patients, especially advanced heart failure patients, they lose autoregulation, and that's why they tend to be much more susceptible to renal dysfunction. So our phase two of our study, we're now looking at end-stage heart failure patients. We're going to be looking at their uh, kidney autoregulation. Why are we doing that? Because we need a marker that we can follow from a prognostic standpoint, a marker that may be sensitive to actually looking at people and identifying patients who have a higher risk of developing CRS, but also something that we can use as a surrogate endpoint to look to see if therapeutic interventions are making a difference. Even if in the global gross clinical scale we don't see a benefit, this may be at least a surrogate marker that tells us we're going in the right direction. Realizing with everything I said, this is an extremely tough challenge. It's difficult. We really oftentimes don't know what to do. But I'll guarantee you that if we persist, we will get to the bottom of this. Thank you.